Blood clots are normally protective, but they can also be harmful, leading to diseases such as deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, or stroke. Smoking is a major cause of heart disease and increases the risk of heart attacks due to atherosclerosis. Here, the narrowing and clogging of the arteries with tar and fatty substances increases the risk of blood clotting. See, I told you. Luckily, these conditions can be treated with anticoagulants, sometimes incorrectly labelled blood thinners, which work by reducing these unnecessary blood clots. In Australia, there are currently four types of anticoagulants used, one traditionally and three recently approved by the TGA. These are warfarin, dabigatran, rivaraxaban and apixaban. Since the 60s, thromboembolic diseases were only treated with one oral anticoagulant drug, warfarin. Warfarin works by antagonising the action of vitamin K, an essential component involved in the activation of certain clotting factors, 2, 7, 9 and 10, when major bleeding occurs. As a result, vitamin K is oxidised into vitamin K epoxide. However, the liver enzyme vitamin K epoxide reductase complex 1 is capable of recycling vitamin K epoxide back into vitamin K. By strongly inhibiting vitamin K epoxide reductase complex 1, warfarin hinders this process and the liver produces defective clotting factors. In 2008, rivaraxaban and dibigatrin were approved by the TGA, while apixaban was later approved in 2012. Unlike warfarin, rivaraxaban and apixaban are competitive reversible antagonists that activate factor 10 to 10A, which assists in the formation of thrombin, while dabigatran antagonizes factor 2A, which converts fibrinogen to fibrin. So, how does warfarin differ to the NOAX? Let's start with the advantages. Warfarin is a well-known drug. It can be administered to patients with valvular atrial fibrillation, it's low in cost, but most importantly, there are antidotes available. On the other hand, NOACs have a faster onset of action, fixed dosing, stable therapeutic levels, predictable pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, it has a shorter half-life, and patients pending surgery do not have to undergo bridging. But of course, there are also some disadvantages of both. Warfarin has a narrower therapeutic index, slow onset and offset of action, and multiple drug and food interactions, for example, with ibuprofen, naproxen, allergy medications, vitamin K-rich food, and many antibiotics. Furthermore, patients are required to undergo bridging pre-surgery, and with unpredictable pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, frequent INR monitoring is essential. NOACs also have their own issues. For instance, they cannot be administered to patients with valvular atrial fibrillation. Additionally, patients require twice-daily dosage, while those with renal impairment need dose adjustment. There is also a lack of long-term safety data, and it is known that the NOACs can cause GIT hemorrhage, myocardial infarction, and intracranial bleeding. Lab monitoring tools are also unreliable and NOACs are very, very costly. Now let's look at some key issues that limit the use of both drugs. There are certain people who cannot take warfarin as it poses serious health risks to them. These include pregnant women, which may lead to fetal warfarin syndrome in the newborn, patients who are actively bleeding, for example due to a bleeding or blood cell disorder like haemophilia, patients with peptic ulcers or post-organ surgery or biopsy, and those with kidney and liver failure. Alternatively, whilst the NOACs have a faster onset of action, the drug effects rapidly diminish over time. Skipping a dose may lead to an increased risk of embolism, and prolonged use of rivaraxaban can lead to osteoporosis. The NOACs are also contraindicated in elderly patients with unstable INR values, as these patients may be suffering from impaired cognition or depression. The NOACs are metabolised via the liver, hence they are contraindicated in patients with liver dysfunction. Patients with decreased renal clearance, specifically with a creatinine clearance of less than 15 mls per minute, should also avoid the NOACs, as there is an increased risk of the drugs being cleared unchanged through the kidney. Taking the NOACs with antiplatelet agents such as aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are discouraged, as this drug interaction consequently leads to an increased risk of bleeding. Hmm, what's left to say? Oh, taking the NOACs result in reduced plasma levels, but most importantly, note that unlike warfarin, there are no antidotes available for the NOACs. Remember this man? Considering all that has been presented, what do you think is the best drug for this patient?